Hey everyone, welcome to Experiencing MIS Chapter 12. In this video, we are talking about the process of developing a new uh, information system for an organization. Uh, we'll be just introducing the idea of what systems development entails, as well as some risks that are inherent with the process of developing a new system from scratch, because it can be a very complicated problem. Systems development is the process of creating and maintaining information systems, and we'll actually define what maintaining an information system means uh, later on in the chapter, but we're essentially uh, getting an organization where we either need to make a new uh, information system or we need to upgrade an existing one. Maybe we need to replace an existing one even. Um, but we're going through the process of figuring out, well, what does our new information system need to do? And how do we make all of that happen? Now, I want to really emphasize the fact that this is more than just software design. So it's going to require more than just a few programmers piecing together an individual program. That would be more software design, uh, computer programming, a little bit of work with data itself, maybe designing what some of the data models might look like for that particular program, but that might be relatively limited in scope. When we're talking about systems development, we are talking about the entirety of an information system. We're piecing, we're piecing together all the hardware, the software, the data, the procedures, and the people. We might be also taking different pieces off the shelf rather than creating everything from scratch. So. In software development, you know, we might take a little bit of software off the shelf. We might take something that someone already has made and on, add on to it. Or if we're just looking for some piece of software that works, it could be possible for us to just buy the entirety of that software off the shelf and not have to change, you know, design anything new or change anything about that off the sh shelf software for it to just work for us. But when we're working with an entire information system, we won't be able to get everything off the shelf. We could buy all of our hardware, we could buy all of our software, um, a data model might come with some of that software. So we don't have to figure out how we're going to store the data, how we're going to structure our databases or anything like that. But to some extent, we still have to put all of those pieces together. We still have to make the procedures for it and we still have to hire the people in order to make that information system work. So no matter what, we are doing some amount of systems development when we're piecing together an information system, even if we do as much as we can to not have to develop anything in house. Furthermore, the fact that you know, the creation of new software or the creation of new hardware is not the entirety of information systems development and even could be a very small or non-existent part of systems development means that there's an emphasis on business knowledge here. Um, you need management skills. You need to be able to communicate with people to understand people's needs and to help sort of coax their needs out of them, even if they don't know necessarily what they need or how to express their needs or something like that. Um, you also need to be able to figure out what the, you know, what people need to interact with the system if you are hiring new people on. So there will be some components where you're writing up job descriptions or something like that. Also creating the, the procedures and seeing how everything flows together. All of that kind of stuff is going to require a sort of, um, outside view. You need to be able to look at the entirety of the system that you're making rather than just looking more at the inside of, say, the software that you're writing or the hardware that you're working with or something like that. So systems development will require a lot of business experience, which is why we're talking about it right here. Business people are the ones fundamentally in charge of developing a new system and any technical expertise that we need, you know, it can be really nice to have management supplemented with technical expertise, maybe the leading, um, 
you know, some leading technical manager has some experience as a programmer and can help inform decisions. But in the end, um, business expertise is going to be most important to this whole process. Now, this is an incredibly tricky process. And as we kind of go through some of the different stages of uh, the at least one method of designing a system throughout some of the rest of this video, you might get a sense of how tricky this problem really can be. But I'm going to kind of at the very beginning of all this talk about some of the difficulties in how tricky uh, the system development process can actually be. Um, it's very easy for these big complex projects to set a budget and a time goal and miss one or both of those goals. They can be over budget in order to finish everything that needs to be done. They can go over time in order to finish everything within budget. It's possible that they finish within budget and time, but then don't actually accomplish everything that they are supposed to accomplish. So. There's a lot of tricky, tricky things when it comes to figuring out how to make a new information system and then going about actually creating the thing. And, you know, we'll talk about this a little bit more as we go throughout this chapter, but as best as we can do, you know, try to um, figure out how much it will cost us to make a system or how long it will take us to create a system it usually isn't that easy so all that in consideration um here are the five types of risks that um we're going to at least talk about in this chapter and i'll go through each one of them one by one uh there's risks because it is difficulty to determine the requirements of a system, what a system is supposed to be able to do. Uh, requirements can change, especially through development. Um, this could partially be because, you know, the organization itself has overhauled maybe its competitive strategy or the people who would be working with the uh, new system. You know, maybe the company's direction has changed. Uh, maybe users have realized, oh, all that stuff that we said was important no longer is because of whatever reason we have to completely change the you know what is important we need to change those requirements for the system all that kind of stuff um any sort of change in what the system is supposed to do can be really detrimental to the development of a system because we design and build our systems based on what they are supposed to do. So if the fundamental information of what they're supposed to do changes, then, well, it doesn't work very well. That's the second type of risk. We'll go into that in a little bit more detail. Um, scheduling and budgeting difficulties. I talked about that a little bit. Technology changes. Um, technology will change through development. We'll talk about that a little more. And uh, diseconomies of scale, which is a very fun one. I'll introduce that concept once we get there. So when it comes to determining the requirements of the system, how do we know what the system is supposed to do? How do we know what it's supposed to look like? How do we know how users are supposed to interact with it? All these questions are extremely necessary in order to actually work, you know, actually create the system. We need to know what the system can do in order for the system to actually be created. Um, if you've ever tried assembling an, a, a piece of Ikea furniture, let's say, you know, they have those fun little instruction manuals that don't actually have any words. It's all pictures. And sometimes you can kind of figure out what pieces are supposed to go where based on the model numbers and all that kind of stuff. And in the end, um, if you're able to keep track of, you know, which screws you're supposed to use where, which pieces of the furniture you're supposed to use where, and maybe keep the end product of what it's supposed to look like when you're done in mind so you can catch any errors when things maybe stop looking the way that they're supposed to, well, you might be able to successfully build your dresser or chair or desk or whatever type of furniture you want that has a name that is very hard to pronounce. But imagine that same piece of IKEA furniture without 
any of the parts being labeled. So they tell you to use the wooden rectangle, but they don't say which model number the wooden rectangle is, you know, like which part number is associated with that particular rectangle. And you have five different rectangles of different shapes, but they all kind of look like the rectangle in the, um, in the instruction manual, right? That could be a little bit hard without that piece of information, that identifying information that tells you which rectangle is which and when you should use that rectangle. Or if the instruction manual doesn't even have any images whatsoever, it's just a sheet of blank paper, then you don't know how everything is supposed to fit together. And if you don't know how everything is supposed to fit together, well, maybe the best you can do is guess based on what the final product looks like, right? But even then, what if you don't know what the final product looks like at all? You don't have a picture of it. Maybe, you know, maybe you have the instruction manual, but maybe you don't know what the final thing is supposed to look like. You never actually saw any images of it. You never went to the showroom or anything like that. You just have a bunch of boards and an instruction manual and you have to put it together. Um, it could be kind of possible to do, but it might be a little tricky to check for errors because you don't know what the thing looks like, so you don't know if the shape is a little weird, maybe until it's too late. So if you don't have all of that really important information, then it's really hard to put together that piece of furniture. Similar thing here, you need all of this really important information about what an information system should do and how people should be able to interact with it and what uh, information they should be able to get out of it in order to actually build the thing in the first place. So a couple questions that might be helpful in figuring out the requirements for the system is, are, uh, what should our information system do? And what needs to be done to make it ready to use? What needs to be done in order to allow users to use it? Speaking of that, there's also how do users interact with it? How are they supposed to interact with the system? How should they be able to get data into the system and get information out of the system? How can they choose what operations are done by the system and all that kind of stuff? Also, what should they be able to do? What tasks should they be able to complete in the information system? And then, of course, like we talked about before, uh, what security is needed because you should be security minded from the very beginning of the process. And you should be thinking about this before you even start working on the information system. Now, requirements will change. Um, systems will evolve over time, especially if you have a really, really big system and a much longer time for the project to be completed. That might mean that more changes happen. There's more time for changes to be made and more places where changes could be made too. So, as the system develops, uh, requirements could completely change and that could be a major setback in the project. Things might have to be completely changed or at least somewhat modified. And that can be seen as possibly a loss of potentially useful time that could have been put into actually completing the, the thing. So the big question when you're building a um, system like this is how do you adapt to these changes in requirements? And there's not really an easy answer. Uh, there's a couple of ways that people have tried to um, overcome this fact that requirements will change over time. And we'll kind of talk about a little bit in how people have tried to adapt to these changes in multiple ways. But yeah, that's a big question, is how do you adapt to these changes? With uh, the scheduling and the budget, um, it is really hard to determine the length of system development, even if it seems really simple. Oh, I can just assemble these components together, make these sort of data pipelines from one component to the next, do all these transformations, and then spit it out so that the user is able to get the final piece. Even that can be... Uh, tricky in ways that you might not expect. Anything with computer technology um, 
just has the tendency to go wrong when and where you don't expect it to go wrong, especially if software development is included as part of creating a new system. Uh, it is very easy for errors to be made in software, also in hardware, if uh, custom hardware is being created. So that can push out how long it will take for the project to be completed. Um, kind of related to this, uh, you can think of it sort of as, um, I, I don't know if those of you who might have used Windows XP or 98 or 95 or something like that, remember some of the loading bars where they gave an estimate of how long it would take for a certain operation to be completed, like uh, installing a program off of a CD or downloading a file from online, which actually you might be able to see that nowadays as well when you download a file from online. If, if you've ever seen the time estimate jump around like four minutes, two seconds, five hours, 99 hours, three seconds, eight minutes, all that kind of stuff, that jumping around is kind of representative, to me at least, of how um, trying to plan out a length of time of, you know, anything involving computers tends to go. Uh, fun fact for those of you who might be uh, on the younger side watching my videos, if you are confused as to why in Among Us the um, data transfer tasks always have that time limit that jumps around between like hours, days, months, years, and then back down to three, two, one seconds, right? Um, that actually is why, because Windows XP in particular, I think was pretty notorious for not having very good estimates on how long it would take for things like file transfers or program installs to be completed. So it's a, a little nod to that aspect of computers and, you know, I would say something that is related to an aspect of working with computer systems in general is it's hard to tell exactly how long it will take for a computer related project to be completed because things just go wrong and you have to fix it. Correct your mistakes, try again. Oh, it's now something else is going wrong. You have to correct your mistake, try again. All that kind of stuff. It's very common. It pushes back development time. Now, the problem with this is that be directly because it's hard to determine how long it will take to develop a system and get everything to work, it is really hard to determine the cost of, you know, making everything work. In part because we pay people to make projects like this, and the longer they spend making a project, the more we are paying them. So that is a direct reason why the budget is also hard to figure out right away. Um, we, for time and budget, we can try to make our best estimate of like, here's how well it might go, best case, here's what we think it might happen, here's what might happen worst case, and even then we might not realize, oh, well here's this error that we didn't anticipate happening. Uh, that has just doubled the amount of time it will take for us to complete this. Uh, information system. So budgets are really hard to estimate. And as you might know, budgets are very important for businesses because they need to know how much money they're spending on things because they want it to turn a profit. So if you don't have a certain schedule or budget, how are you supposed to plan for development? Um, the answer seems to be we try our best. Uh, some ways of creating a new system like this uh, just accept from the very beginning that, yeah, uh, we might have to be very, very flexible with our schedule and budget to some certain extent, of course, but there should be that amount of flexibility and we're going to try to impress upon our managers and shareholders and whatnot that it is very important for this project to have that kind of flexibility. Other methods are a little bit more set in stone and kind of, you know, hope for the best that they can control errors and setbacks by being very careful about things. But 
Even then, there's never a clear answer for this. The next issue is changing technology, because as you are developing your new system, technology does not pause. There could be new softwares or hardwares or procedure software database combinations that could come out. And you might want to consider whether it's best to scrap everything and hop onto the new thing or to keep going with possibly outdated technology. And each has their pros and cons. Uh, if you decide to hop onto the latest thing, well, it's possible that a new latest and greatest thing comes out. And do you hop on again? Do you keep on hopping on over and over and over again? At what point do you stop and just accept what you have as your budget is dwindling and dwindling and dwindling and you just try to make the best with what you got? Or should you stay with an old system and hope that there's not too many bad things that result from using slightly older technology, like um, errors or lack of support or that kind of thing. So it's a huge thing to try to figure out. Now with diseconomies of scale, we have talked about the economy of scale, which is when you buy something in bulk, you get a better price per individual item than if you buy the same amount of things one at a time. So for example, that's why Costco is able to offer you great deals on products. Well, I guess that and the membership fees and the supply chain type of stuff, but part of it is also because, you know, they are buying things in extreme bulk because they're selling it in, in extreme bulk. So they're buying in extreme bulk more so than maybe some other grocery stores might be, and they're getting a better price on uh, those items, which they're then able to pass on to the consumer, who is also buying in bulk, so they are getting a better price on all of those items. That's the economy of scale. We've talked about that quite a bit, especially with uh, computer hardware. The diseconomy of scale is the opposite, where more can actually be slightly less profitable. In this case, what we're talking about is large development teams means average worker contribution decreases. Now, if you have a 10 person development team, uh, odds are each person is going to be pretty well informed on what every other person is doing because all you have to do is a quick check in like, hey, what'd you get done? What'd you get done? What did you get done? What did you get done? All that kind of stuff it's a lot easier for them to communicate their progress and work together and solve problems and all that kind of stuff. Now, if you compare a 1000 person development team, that's going to be a lot trickier because each individual worker is going to have to spend quite a bit of time getting caught up on the progress of the project as a whole. Now that probably won't be all 1000 workers uh, standing up and sharing their uh, progress one at a time. But this might be um, multiple teams, each reporting their progress in a large team-wide meeting. And that might take quite a bit of time. If it's uh, three hours of meetings per week in order to keep everyone up to date and make sure that all the work is actually, you know, still benefiting the project and no one's straying off the beaten path or no work is conflicting or something like that. If that's three hours of meetings a week for one worker, well, that is a collective of 3000 um, hours per all of the workers in this uh, 1000 worker team compared to when it was 10 minutes, uh, 10 workers in the team, that's uh, 100 minutes, barely over one hour of time spent with all this communication and stuff. So really what's happening here is um, the business management is essentially paying an overhead of 3,000 hours of just redundant work because all of those people have to be in the meeting. Uh, and that's not 3,000 hours that they can pay towards actually making the, the project progress in a good direction. 
um, instead it is 3,000 hours that they're paying to get everyone caught up. And, you know, it could be a worthwhile investment if uh, that work is needed to make sure the, prog the project stays on track and everyone's communicating and all that kind of stuff. But you kind of get diminishing returns as a business. So this average worker contribution decrease here. Um, I kind of got away from the average worker contribution idea, but I, that, that's sort of the idea of what the diseconomy of scale is, is, um, you know, there's a lot more of that redundant work going on. Average worker contribution decreases because each individual worker is spending more and more and more time in meetings as opposed to uh, in a smaller team. The smaller team is like 10 minutes per week. Uh, in the larger team, it was three hours per week per worker. So the larger team worker is contributing less to a project than the smaller team worker. Now, on top of that, you have Brooks Law. Uh, adding more people to a late project makes the project more late or later. Um, what this is referring to is if you have a project that is nearing a deadline or if it has already gone over deadline, uh, a, a company's first instinct might be to add more workers onto the project so it will be completed faster. But there's a lot of time wasted because those new workers have to be trained, you know, they have to get caught up to speed, uh, and then there has to be that extra communication, which is wasting more time and that average worker contribution decreases. So this is another instance in where the diseconomy of scale comes in with a uh, project team size is that if you add more and more and more workers to a project, uh, there's going to be more time spent on non working on the project things, which means that the project might become even more late. So then you get this uh, dilemma where a business needs to decide if they're going to have more staff in a project or less staff in a project. Um, having smaller teams working on projects means that the project will take a lot longer to complete since there's fewer workers who are working on it, but um, they are able to work a lot more efficiently and they can probably get it done for cheaper because of that. Whereas a larger team, overall will finish the project a lot faster, but then you have this diseconomy of scale, which means that even if it's a uh, faster project completion, it might cost more overall to complete the project than it would with a smaller team. So a business has to evaluate its priorities and figure out, okay, do we need this right away? Or are we good with possibly, you know, risking all the changes in technology and changes in requirements and all that kind of stuff and have it be done by a smaller team that will get more of a cost benefit out of. So in order to deal with all of these risks, um, over time, as businesses became more and more accustomed with how to build up these information systems, uh, especially, you know, early on in computing technology where information systems were still new and people were figuring all of this stuff out by the seat of their pants, essentially. Um, some methodologies uh, developed in order to help deal with a lot of these problems that come with the different risks. Uh, a couple of the methodologies that uh, we'll kind of talk about throughout all of this one is the systems development life cycle that actually is the focus of this chapter. And a second is agile, which I will briefly mention every once in a while, but I won't focus on very much. Now the systems development life cycle or the SDLC is a project that is used to develop information systems. And essentially what people did in order to create the SDLC is Identify core um, tasks that need to be completed in order to actually develop an information system. Uh, things like, well, figuring out what the thing actually is supposed to do and then actually uh, designing uh, the system itself before actually creating the thing and putting it in place. Um, 
that that kind of thinking uh right there they 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 broke it into the different uh phases of the system's development life cycle in order to you know focus on one phase at a time make sure one phase is complete before moving on to the next one and that way um you can try to minimize error you can try to minimize um changes in previous work because you have just completed everything in one phase you don't need to return to that phase hypothetically you can just move on to the next thing and you'll have like a very solid footing to build off of because of how well you did during the first phase and so on and so forth so that's the idea of the systems development life cycle is you take all the tasks that you need to complete a information system break it into phases and then complete those phases one at a time now there's a lot of different variants of the system systems development life cycle uh some break it into eight some break it into seven some break it into five we are going to focus on one of the five phase sdlcs in this chapter here's an overview of all of the phases and what we'll do is we'll go through each of these phases one at a time throughout the rest of the videos um so in the business planning process uh, when you're actually planning what the business is going to do you're going to recognize that we need an information system in order to effectively uh, work towards our competitive strategy from there you define what that system should be do we need a system that can process consumer data and predict buying patterns in the future or something like that from there you come up with a project plan and start figuring out the requirements for what that system needs to be able to do what kind of data should it take in what in what ways should it interface with our existing systems how should users be able to work with it uh, what tasks should they be able to do in it all that kind of stuff you figure out all the requirements for that project and then you uh, approve those requirements uh, and start going in and designing the different components of the information system you're going to figure out what hardware software data procedures and people you're going to be using for this whole thing and then once you have all of that prerequisite information you start implementing things you build up any components that need to be built in-house you start assembling things together and you eventually get to the point where you install it in the business and people start using it and you continue to maintain it as people use it and discover problems or discover that there's a need to update the system or change something or whatever that all that is in this system maintenance phase and what that can actually do is completely start the cycle over again because it is a cycle if you need to update your system or if you need to make a dramatic change to the system uh, that might mean going back and reevaluating what the system needs to be how people should be able to interact with it what the system should be able to do what the design of some component that you need to update needs to look like and then you implement it and put it back in and etc cetera, etc cetera. this is a big cycle so all of that is an introduction to these to systems development as a whole and then getting into an introduction of the systems development life cycle now the rest of the videos are going to focus on the systems development life cycle uh with the exception of i believe the last one we briefly talk a little more about agile but with the systems development life cycle we're going to focus on that for all the middle videos in which we actually go into more detail on the different phases of the SDLC, the the five phases that we are focusing on in particular we'll focus on all of those and then that knowledge will actually be really helpful for you because phases like that tend to be either used or you know maybe some features of those different phases are kind of smashed together or separated or something like that in different uh design methodologies like the different versions of 
agile design methodologies that exist out there. But once you recognize these um, core parts, this will be really helpful for you, even if you have to hypothetically, let's say, design your own system using a different design methodology, or even if you want to compare and contrast design methodologies for yourself, if you get to choose what methodology to use. So uh, all of that detailed information will be really helpful for that.